Is it coming on? Does it? it says no selection. That's for the audio. Okay. It should be coming on. Oh yeah, here it comes. Slowly warming up. Okay, so shall we take our seats? So today we have um, the last of my lectures for this first half before the midterm exam. So we'll start off with cardiovascular system with a, and then a lab and then we'll follow up with integument and a lab, okay? Um, kind of basic things that we need to understand. So any, anybody got any questions for me before we proceed? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, well, the TAs can elaborate. Why don't you go ahead? And then also, in addition to that, bring all your questions that you want answered, any and all questions. It doesn't have to be specifically on what is presented to you. You know, any question at all, anything that you've been studying that you're not clear about, it's, it's basically your opportunity to really, you know, catch them in one spot and get them to answer your questions. Yes? The lab component, you have questions A, B, C, D, E, just like you do for the written component, multiple choice, right? Pick the right or wrong answer. And then an image will be shown. And then there's a question. Identify this cell type from normal blood, okay? And then the, you know, A is red blood cells, eosinophils, B, basophils, monocyte, leukocyte, or lymphocyte, whatever, right? So you identify the cell. And if it was a red blood cell A, you pencil in A. You get a minute or so, and then they'll say, okay, next question. So that's if you haven't written something down, you can go back. And you can, you can also pencil and mark up the exam question, the exams, right? You can write all over it. You can say on there, I hate Dr. Jarkio, okay? It's all going to get shredded anyway. <laughs> you can write whatever you want on there. So you can circle what you think is the right answer, but you can go back to it later if you're not sure, okay? You won't see the image again, but at the end of the exam, you can say, oh, I didn't answer question three, you know, and I, you've had an hour or so, and you think, okay, now I think this is the right answer. Or if you feel confident, you pencil it in straight away. Some people don't pen pencil anything in until the very end, then they go through and do it, okay? But you have to, so what happens is, you, both for the written for, and for the practical, you will get, you know, the printed exam. You write your name on there, it'll be numbered. You have to hand in the written exam and your Scantron. If, if you don't hand in your written exam, you will not get a grade, okay? So all exams must be returned. They cannot leave the room. There'll be a sheet of, blank sheet of paper on the back. You can write in your A, B, C, D, E answers for you to keep, right? Just a single sheet of paper, you can keep that but you can't keep the exam. And you will write your name on it and it'll be numbered. So if somebody doesn't hand in an exam, we'll know who it was, right? Yeah. Mixture. Some of them may be from the PowerPoints. Some of them you haven't seen before. Okay, other questions? Okay. Well, you know, I think that it's pretty clear. 
But if you, if you haven't seen that image before, you know, if you're just memorizing what's already in the PowerPoints, then that may cause you a problem. You're supposed to be able to identify a tissue. So I might show you a picture of, a, of one of the components of blood that wasn't in the PowerPoints, but you still got to be able to identify it. Some of them, yeah, well, we, we, I think that all the, the slides are clear what they are, in my opinion, okay? We're not trying to trick you, we're trying to test you, okay? So, uh, you know, if you're having trouble, it might be because you really didn't know that one. Okay, other questions? Okay, then let's move on to cardiovascular system. So cardiovascular heart vessels system, right? So we're going to look at um, the different circulatory systems of the cardiovascular system um, and then some of the components, the capillaries and um, larger blood vessels, <coughs> larger blood vessels, um, structure of them. They have a common structure. And then look at the structure of the various arteries, arterioles, veins, venules, capillaries. And then the heart, which is the pump that drives the blood around through the cardiovascular system. And then in parallel, the lymphatic system, which drains um, fluid from the tissue into the lymph vessels and, of course, gets filtered through lymph nodes, which we know all about from Monday's lecture. So let's first look at the circulatory system. So the circulatory system consists of the cardiovascular system, which is basically blood circulating through blood vessels pumped by heart that circulates around and around. And as I mentioned, in parallel, there's a drainage system, which is one way, the lymphatic system, which drains lymph fluid from the connective tissue into lymphatic vessels. It's not, there's no pump, it's just uh, moved by, um, I guess by when you move your body, it squeezes the lymphatic vessels and it, there are valves in those vessels, so it can only go in one direction. So cardiovascular system, it circulates in the lymphatic system, it's unidirectional. Okay, so then if we look at the cardiovascular system, there's actually two circulations. There's the pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation. So first the systemic circulation. So from the left ventricle, the heart is, the blood is pumped from the heart into the aorta, which is the largest of the arteries, and then it goes down through progressively smaller arteries, like the larger arteries are elastic arteries, then muscular arteries, arterioles, and eventually into capillaries, which are able to um, allow for the distribution of fluid into and out of the capillaries in and around the various organs and tissues. Then that blood um, continues through the various tissues and organs and is collected in small venules and then in larger um, or within veins and larger veins, such as the vena cava, which then empties um, into the um, heart again. Now, in parallel, we have the lymphatic system, which is unidirectional, and that drains into um, the large veins just before they go back to the heart again. So in this particular case, the, the blood coming from the heart in the systemic system is newly oxygenated, so the blood in the arterial system is oxygenated. It gives up oxygen in the tissues and the organs, picks up carbon dioxide, and so then the blood in the venous system, the veins, is relatively deoxygenated and contains more carbon dioxide before it returns to the heart. The pulmonary system is that circulation that takes the blood to the lungs to be oxygenated and to release carbon dioxide and return it to the heart before it can then be distributed through the systemic system. So because the blood that just came from the systemic system is deoxygenated, the blood that passes through the, through the pulmonary arteries going towards the lungs is deoxygenated. And the blood coming, from the, coming in the pulmonary veins, just coming from the lungs, is oxygenated. So what this means is that the oxygen content of arteries and veins is reversed in the systemic and the pulmonary system. So in the systemic arteries, it's oxygenated. 
in pulmonary arteries that's deoxygenated, in systemic veins that's deoxygenated, in pulmonary veins that's oxygenated. Yeah. <coughs> no, it circulates. <coughs> Excuse me, it's the um, lymphatic system. You need directional. <coughs> it drains one direction into the venous system. It doesn't circulate. So you understand that, that concept of the oxygen and carbon dioxide content being opposite in arteries and veins of systemic and pulmonary system, yeah? Deoxygenated. So obviously um, in the systemic system, which is most of your body, the blood is deoxygenated. Veins, right, tend to be purple, right? There's no oxygen. They're not red, they're purple. That's because they've been through all the tissues. They're going back to the heart. That same blood then is pumped from the heart into the pulmonary system. So now that deoxygenated blood is in the pulmonary arteries because it hasn't got to the lungs yet to be oxygenated. Okay? And conversely, the blood coming from the heart into the arteries is oxygenated. And since the blood coming from the lungs obviously would be oxygenated, that's coming from the lungs in the veins. So pulmonary veins are oxygenated. You had a question? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't have red blood cells. It's just got lymphocytes for the most part. So, but yeah, it's, it's more analogous to the venous system. Okay, other questions? Yeah, we'll get to that at the kind of toward the end of this lecture. Okay, so then, uh, so then you understand that there's a systemic and a pulmonary circulatory system with opposite oxygen and carbon dioxide content in the arteries and veins of each of those two systems. So let's look at the smallest of the blood vessels, the capillaries. So at the level of the tissues, these are the capillaries, very the smallest blood vessels, just a little bit wide enough to let a um, leukocyte or a red blood cell squeeze through, not much wider than that. Some of them have a little smooth muscle um, sphincter that can close off the um, capillary, like this precapillary sphincter, to regulate the flow of blood through these capillaries. So the capillaries then are basically the level of exchange of fluids and gases and nutrients of the tissue. They're the smallest of the blood vessels. That's where we have everything diffusing in and out or passing in and out of the tissues and organs. So if we look at a cross section through a continuous capillary, so here's our lumen. This is, would be just wide enough for, say, a red blood cell to squeeze through, right? And then this, this capillary is lined by an endothelial cell. Here's the nucleus of the capillary and a very thin rim of cytoplasm shown here at the perimeter. So that's our capillary lined by endothelial cells. And then outside the endothelial cells, we'll have a basement membrane. And then sometimes you'll see a pericyte. And the pericyte is thought to be able to renew um, damaged endothelial cells. So that's the basic structure of a continuous capillary. OK, now there are different classifications of capillaries that you should be familiar with. So the continuous capillary is the most common that we'll see in most tissues and organs. Sometimes we have a capillary that's got these fenestrations in the wall of the endothelial cell. Basically, it's um, a little bit, it's a diaphragm that um, is spanned across this fenestration with a diaphragm that is even thinner than the plasma membrane. Okay, so that's a fenestrated capillary. And then we have some exceptions or, or, or variations there on. In the kidney, we actually don't have a a diaphragm spanning the fenestration. What we have is a much thicker basement membrane that covers over that fenestration that then acts as a diaphragm. So the kidney has this, and I, Dr. Andrews will talk about that a lot when he gives you the histology of the kidney lecture, yes. Yeah. I'm gonna show you a picture of that. Yeah, that's just, this is just schematic. Okay, and then, so that's a fenestrated capillary, and then sometimes you have an even wider structure, um, which we call a sinusoid, 
um, these also align by single layer of endothelial cells, but they have a big space um, between the endothelial cells. And we saw pictures of these in the spleen, remember, where the red blood cell was squeezing between the fenestrations of the endothelial cells of the spleen, where the red blood cells would be captured if they're aged and destroyed. So that's a sinusoid. It has a wider lumen. Sinusoids have a much wider lumen, and they have spaces or holes not spanned with the diaphragm, just an open space of the endothelial cells. So we can see the differences between these three here now. So this is the continuous capillary. This is the endothelial cell. This is the lumen. Here's the endothelial cell cytoplasm. Here's the basement membrane. You can see it's continuous and you've got vesicles passing across the endothelial cell. The fenestrated capillary, you can see, has these diaphragms spanned by these very thin fenestrations. So it kind of looks like a continuation of the plasma membrane, but it turns out that this diaphragm is actually a little bit thinner than the actual plasma membrane. So that's a fenestrated diaphragm. And then, of course, the sinusoids has a space or a hole between the endothelial cells. Okay, so um, a lot easier for, you know, larger structures to, to actually flow into and out of the sinusoidal capillaries. So that's the three basic types of, of um, capillaries, yeah. The diaphragm is a membrane, okay? So you've got, you've got the fenestration is the hole, and then across that hole is a membrane, which we call the diaphragm. It's a membrane that covers the hole. So no cell is going to pass through there. Okay, it's only fluids, very small molecules. Okay, it's not, nothing is going to get through there easily. It spans the hole. You can see it here. It goes from one end of the epithelium to the other. That's the diaphragm right there. Here's another one right there. It's basically a little bit thinner than a plasma membrane. It's like a, almost like the plasma membrane covers that hole. Very thin sheet. Okay, another question? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, basically sinusoidal capillaries in the spleen. Okay, other questions? So moving right along, then here is a picture of another continuous capillary, the most common. So here's the nucleus, cytoplasm of endothelial cells. Here's the lumen. And so what, what do these capillaries do? Well, you can have, sometimes you can have pores or gaps in them, depending upon the type of capillary. Obviously, fluids and small molecules can readily diffuse into and out of the capillary, um, particularly if they're continuous or fenestrated. There'll be partial filtration of compounds passing across the uh, membrane or the epithelial cytoplasm. Um, you can get vesicular transport to help compounds pass across the endothelial cell. And sometimes these um, vesicles may line up to form a channel so you can get much more rapid transport. Okay, so these are all mechanisms of exchange by which compounds and fluids can pass into and out of a continuous capillary or fenestrated capillary. Okay, so this shows you the vesicular transport. So here is the cytoplasm of the endothelial cell. Here's the lumen. This is the basement membrane. And it, this, this particular case has been injected with an electron-dense material, this, these black splotches. And you can see that they're taken up, endocytosed, if you like, into some of these vesicles. So endocytosed into the vesicle, then the vesicle could move across to the other side of the endothelial cell to transport larger proteins, compounds, from one side of the endothelial cell to the other. Sometimes these vesicles may actually um, merge. So here you can see a large vesicle, and it's so big that it merged. So again, it's been injected with electron-dense material. In this case, you can see like you could have had one vesicle, two vesicles, three vesicles, four vesicles merge together to form a channel, all right? You can get a bunch of these vesicles merged together to form a channel, 
and then you can get much more rapid um, vesicular transport, transendothelial transport. Here you can see very large vesicle, so big that it actually spans from one side of the endothelial cell to, to the other. So vesicles can get large and merge to form actual channels, which will allow for much more rapid transport of larger molecules across the endothelial cell cytoplasm. Okay, so what do um, some of these um, capillaries do? Okay, so the endothelial cells have adhesion molecules on them, and that in part controls diapodesis. Remember, diapodesis is that process by which, for instance, um, eosinophils may squeeze through the endothelial cell spaces in response to um, eosinophil chemotactic factor secreted by basophils at some location of infection, right? So in other words, there's adhesion molecules on here that may control diapodesis. Um, these endothelial cells also produce vasoactive compounds such as nitrous oxide, which plays a role in vasodilation. Endothelin, which has the opposite effect, constriction. And they also secrete antithrombogenic factors. In other words, factors that prevent clotting. You don't want clotting in your capillaries because you're trying to maintain fluid circulation, right? Blood circulation, you don't want them clotted up because that defeats the purpose. And these endothelial cells also have a biochemical role. They can convert in angiotensin 1 to 2, which plays a role in vasoconstriction. So these endothelial cells then have um, these biochemical characteristics that <clears throat> facilitate um, circulation and diapodesis. Yes? Are they separate? Do they separate no, not, not that I'm aware of. I, I think it's other factors. Okay, so let's look at the structure of blood vessels. So if we look at the structure of blood vessels, they have common, there's three layers that are common to the larger blood vessels. And some of these layers wax and wane as you get down into the smaller blood vessels, depending upon whether it's arteriole and venule. So both large arteries and veins have three layers from the inner surface, the tunica intima, which is the endothelial cells and basement membrane, and some elastic tissue. Tunica media, which is smooth muscle, and tunica adventitia, which is connective tissue. So here it is in schematic. So from the inner surface of this large artery or vein, for that matter, we have an inner layer of endothelial cells bounded then um, by an internal elastic lamina that kind of looks like Swiss cheese, this blue thing. It's a Swiss cheese type of elastic. It's elastic tissue, elastic fibers, right? Internal elastic lamina. So that's the tunica intima. Then we have the middle layer, the tunica media, which is mostly smooth muscle. And we may have a few elastic fibers scattered between the smooth muscle. And on the outer perimeter, sometimes we'll have an external elastic lamina. Okay, This layer, the tunica media, is much thicker in arteries and much thinner in veins, if at all present in veins. Then the outer layer is the tunica adventitia, which is a connective tissue layer. Okay, Some scattering of smooth muscles, fibroblasts, extracellular matrix material. Sometimes we'll have blood vessels within this large connective tissue layer of the tunica adventitia, which we call the vasa vasorum, vessels within the vessels, okay, occasional nerves. So this tunica adventitia, this outer connective tissue layer, is thicker in veins and thinner in arteries. Okay, so we've got this op these opposites. The tunica media, thicker in arteries than veins. The tunica adventitia, thicker in veins than arteries. We'll come back to that. So you can see that here, actually. So this is a cross-section of an artery, a cross-section of a vein. The inner layer is the tunica intima. The middle layer is the tunica media. The outer layer is the, um, the tunica adventitia. So in the artery, the tunica media is much thicker than in the vein. In the vein, the adventitia is much thicker than in the artery. Okay. That helps you to identify them in some cases. So you can see that here in these um, histological sections, H and E and the same section stained with um, an orsine stain. So this 
So this shows you an artery at the bottom and a vein at the top. And, and that, this actually is a very useful slide because quite often arteries and veins go as companions. So you may have um, an arteriole and a venule. They'll be next to each other. Or an artery and a vein of the same, similar um, size go next to each other. So when you see two blood vessels of comparable size, you can that helps you identify whether it's an artery or vein because you can see this vessel has a very thick tunica media, so it's an artery. Here's the companion vessel, a very thin tunica media, so it's the vein. Okay, so just by looking at comparing the two, you might not be sure that this is a, a vein, but when you see this artery next to it, its companion, you can say, yeah, this is the artery, so this is the vein. Okay, that's very important in terms of. Um, helping you to identify and, and um, classify blood vessels. Look for the companion blood vessel of comparable size. This um, table helps you actually to classify arteries and veins. So <clears throat> capillaries have no smooth muscle. The next sized up um, vessel is the arteriole, which will have one to five layers of smooth muscle. So these are still relatively small blood vessels. Um, but if you count, if you see endothelial, if you see smooth muscle and you count five or less, then that makes it an arteriole. From five up to 40 or more, that's a muscular or also called distributing artery. And then the very largest of the arteries are the elastic arteries, which contain um, a large number of elastic fibers in the tunica media. A good example of that is the aorta. So that's the arterial system. The venule system, venules, no typically no smooth muscle. If it's a larger venule and it's a muscular venule, it might have just one or two layers. And then um, as you get larger and larger, the vena cava is, has some unique characteristics. It has um, a very thick tunica um, adventitia that actually has um, bundles of smooth muscle in it running perpendicular to the tunica media. And I'll show you pictures of that and help you um, identify and recognize that. So this table then is pretty useful in terms of um, helping you identify different types of arterial, uh, arterial systems, arterial arteries, and different venual systems, venules and veins, okay? So you might be asked to identify a blood vessel. Okay, so let's look at the structure of arteries then. So we now know that um, arteries have three basic layers, the tunica intima, tunica media, tunica adventitia. Okay, you need to memorize those three layers and what they're all about. So the in cross section, the intima is the endothelial cells, okay, and maybe a bit of connective tissue and then the internal elastic lamina. So the internal elastic lamina is part of the intima, okay, it's the bound, but it's we consider it part of the tunica intima. Then we have a much thicker layer, the tunica media, which is smooth muscle, Right, many layers of smooth muscle, six or more, because if it was five or less, that would make it an arteriole. Six or more makes it an artery. And if it's a big artery, you'll see elastic fibers in here. You can stand that up for elastic fibers. And then the outer bounds of the tunica media is the external elastic lamina. And then beyond the external elastic lamina, we have the tunica adventitia, which is the connective tissue layer. So we can see a very large artery here so here's the intima media adventitia. And note that all these layers of smooth muscle in the tunica media also have an abundance of elastic fibers stained at higher power over here. So this reminds me, okay, elastic fibers. Remember we talked about the evolution of elastic fibers, relatively re recent evolutionary adaptation. It's not in cyclostomes, only in nathostomes. In other words, it's not in the primitive jawless fish. It only first appears in the jawed fish. Nathostomes, and that it was thought to appear in um, the jawed fish because it's associated with high pressure circulatory system. That's when we start to get a more advanced circulatory system with a robust heart that can that's pumping blood at a high pressure. So you can imagine you've got a heart and blood vessels, they're contracting and expanding. You know how many times a, a minute? You know that's that's. Um, going to break after a while if it's not elastic. So, you know, you take a coat hanger, right, a piece of wire, and you twist it like this. It's hard, but you keep twisting it like this after about 20 seconds, it snaps. That was steel. That was a steel coat hanger, but it wasn't elastic. 
So you keep bending something that's going to snap. So you can imagine a blood vessel expanding, contracting, how many times a minute, you know, if it was like a coat hanger, it would snap after a while. That, you know, that person or organism wouldn't last very long. So you've got to have something in there that's elastic, truly elastic, that can expand and contract, expand and contract. So that's why you have these elastic fibers in the tunica media associated with evolution of a high-pressure circulatory system, okay? And that's so that um, elastic fibers are unique to vertebrates. You don't see them in any invertebrates. You only see them in jawed fish and higher, animals with skeletons, nothing else. All, all invertebrates, insects, forget it, cephalopods, you know, all those, all, all those invertebrates, no elastic, didn't evolve in those critters. So it's relatively recent, 400 million years ago was thereabouts. Okay, muscular arteries. So going down from the biggest of the arteries, that was like the um, elastic arteries with all the elastic fibers, the next level down would be the muscular arteries. So here's the um, internal elastic lamina, quite prominent. And so this would be the tunica media. We count the number of cells here. There's six or more, just look, kind of look at the nuclei, six or more layers of cells. So that makes it an artery, not an arteriole. Okay. And here it is stained over here. So a little bit better. So you can see the internal elastic lamina. You can see the tunica media, six or more layers of smooth muscle. And how do you stain a different color, the adventitia? Okay, stains nicely, different colors, even appears differently here. Okay, so you, it's kind of pretty clear in that case that three different layers of the intima media adventitia blood vessels. Shown here again, slightly different stain, but again, again, this is this muscular artery. You can see the internal elastic lemma, so that would be the intima. The media here. You can see this thinner external elastic lamina. Now, the external elastic lamina, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you see a little bit of it. Sometimes it's kind of spotty and, and it comes and goes, <clears throat> depending upon the blood vessel. The smaller the vessel, the less prominent it is. Okay, It kind of disappears after a while in the smallest of blood vessels. And then here's the um, adventitia out here. Okay, so they were true arteries that had six or more layers of smooth muscle. Now we're going to enter the next smallest blood vessel is the arteriole, which has one to five layers of smooth muscle. So if we count the layers of smooth muscle in this blood vessel, I'd say there's probably about three. You know, it's going to vary a little bit. Three or four, certainly five or less. Okay, so that makes it an arteriole. Here it is in electron micrograph, you can see one or two layers of smooth muscle, one, two. Okay, so again, that makes it an arteriole. Okay, so we went from arteries down to, uh, you know, the largest elastic arteries, then distributing or muscular arteries, then arterioles. Okay, and then from the arteriole level, we get to the capillaries and then we get into the venous system. So there's different ways to control circulation at the level of the arteriole to capillary. And here are four different circulations, types of microcirculation. The most common is blood flowing from the arteriole into a capillary bed and then picked up on the other side by a venule. So this might be an organ or a tissue that um, the blood's flowing through. And the blood flowing through these capillaries be can be controlled to some extent by these pre-capillary sphincters, which is like a ring of smooth muscle that can contract or relax to regulate the flow of blood from the arteriole to the venule. That's the most common microcirculation. Sometimes you can short circuit this circulation um, by preventing, by getting the blood to flow directly from an arteriole into a venule. And we call this an arteriovenous anastomosis. And we see these in the skin, which we're going to look at in the next um, subject in an hour or more. AV shunts, arteria venous anastomosis, goes directly from the arteriole straight to the, to the venous system to short circuit circulation. Sometimes we have blood flowing from an arteriole through a capillary bed back into an arteriole. This is pretty rare. We see that in the, glimmer, the glomerulus of the kidney. Dr. Anders will talk about that in great detail. The reason we're having blood going from an arteriole back to an arteriole is because this is under very high pressure. You remember the glomerulus of the kidney is the filtration apparatus. So you've got 
blood being pushed through these glomeruli to filter the blood, right? And even on the on the other side of the um, filtration apparatus, the, the pressure is still relatively high, so they have another arteriole there so that it doesn't rupture. So you go from an arteriole capillary back to an arteriole. Okay, you see that in the kidney. And then the last type of microcirculation is a hepatic portal system where you go venual capillaries back to venules. We see that in the liver. Okay, so you can have different arrangements of capillaries um, with arterioles and venules on either side, or two arterioles on either side, or two venules on either side, or a short circuit directly from arteriole to venule. Okay. So there you go. Four main types of microcirculation. Number one is the most common. Two, three, and four are um, somewhat more restricted uh, under, under special circumstances. Okay, so if we look at the pressure of blood as we go from the heart down to the smallest of the blood vessels, you can see in the arterial system it's quite high and it's pulsating, the diastolic um, systolic pressure from the heart. It slowly declines as you go into the smaller blood vessels because of peripheral resistance, the blood rubbing against the walls of the blood vessels and also because the blood vessels are branching. So in, in fact, the total volume of those smaller blood vessels is greater than the preceding blood vessel. So then the blood pressure declines. And then once you get from the arterioles to the capillaries, it drops precipitously. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> ah, I'm sneezing all day today. Okay, so then the blood vessel drops precipitously in the venous system, okay, and it stays low. So that just shows you the blood pressure um, through the various blood vessels going from the arterial to the venous system. Okay, let's look at structure of veins. So we looked at the structure of arteries. Veins have those three layers, the intima media adventitia, but the media and adventitia vary in thickness. So. The intima looks the same. We've got an internal la layer of endothelial cells and an internal elastic lamina, sometimes not very prominent, depending upon the size of the vein. And then we have a tunica media that may or may not be present, depending upon the size of the venule or the vein. Okay, Not all veins will have a tunica media. You may not see one at all. What you will see in veins is the tunica adventitia, the connective tissue layer, which is by far the thickest layer of veins. The thickest of the veins then is the vena cava, superior and inferior, going back to the heart. The vena cava we can identify because in the tunica media now we see bundles of smooth muscle running perpendicular in the adventitia to the smooth muscle running circumferentially in the media. So what does that mean? That means in this large vein the tunica media is, as you expect, the smooth muscle cells are running circumferentially, circumference, in a circle around the lumen of the blood vessel. That's the tunica media, just like you see it in everything else. But now, in the tunica adventitia, we see bundles of smooth muscle running perpendicular to the media. So the media has smooth muscle going this way, but in the adventitia, the bundles of smooth muscle are going this way. You get that? So that's why in cross-section it appears thus. This is circumferential running around in a circle, and these, these are perpendicular to those of the media. And that's how you recognize a histological section of the vena cava, which I will show you in the lab today. Okay, so let's, let's look at some of the um, venous vessels. So we have from the smallest vessel we have a capillary, the blood, well, actually, the blood will flow from an arteriole into a capillary, then into a post-capillary venule, then into a collecting vein and the muscular vein. So going from the arteriole side down to the capillaries and then back out the other side into the venous system. So that's what some of these vessels will look like. So here's a medium-sized vein. That's a vein because it has a very wide lumen. Usually the lumen collapses in an artery because, remember, it was under pressure. Um, and it has a relatively thin tunica media here, and the adventitia is thicker. And here's the vena cava that I talked about. So this is just a little piece of the vena cava, so it would go all the way, all the way around the room. This is just a little slice. Here, this 
piece here is the tunica media of the vena cava. So this smooth muscle is running perpendicular around the lumen of the vena cava. And then in the adventitia here, you can see how this tissue looks, uh, looks different to that of the media because these are the bundles of smooth muscle that are running perpendicular into and out of the, the image, right? They're running perpendicular into and out of the image, whereas these smooth muscles of the media are running circumferentially around the blood vessel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you've got a ton of blood flowing into the media, so you want some reinforcement um, just to hold the structure together. Okay. The other thing to note about blood vessels, about, about veins, is that they contain valves. Now, arteries do not contain valves, okay, because they have high blood pressure, so the, the pressure just pushes the blood along. It's going to go unidirectionally. Veins, remember, have that precipitous drop off in blood pressure. So you can imagine in a vein, because it has low blood pressure, you could have some blood that wants to flow backwards. So what we have, in fact, are these veins that prevent the retrograde flow of blood through the, the venous vessel. So for instance, blood flows is flowing this direction. This is, these are two little flaps that kind of come together like this. The blood squeezes through. If any blood wants to come back, gets pushed back, it's going to push down here, which will close the valve. So valves then we see in veins. We also see them in lymph vessels. Okay, so they're made of connective tissue lined by endothelial cells, yeah. So here's a vein here. You can see the, the, the blood's flowing to the heart this direction and these valves are preventing any retrograde flow. And basically, the flow of fluid through the veins or the venous system is um, passive simply by muscles and tissues as you move about squeezing on the vessel because the vessel is very loose. You squeeze on it, it's going to squeeze the vessel, the blood's got to go somewhere. It can't go backwards, so it can only go forward, okay, simply by moving around. You can see this histological section through a vein. Here's a little couple of pieces of the valve here, okay and down here, little pieces of the valve that would be like this piece here, okay? Okay, then the heart, let's look at the structure of the heart. Actually, the, the evolution of the heart is a very, it's a very nice, neat story. I think um, you're gonna get more of this when you do physiology. If we look at, so in mammals, we have a four-chambered heart, and actually a couple of reptiles like crocodilians, but most crocodiles don't have four chambers, most reptiles. But if we look at the um, structure of the heart from primitive vertebrates like fish, then going up to amphibians, reptiles, mammals, we see in fish that the, the blood returns to the atrium and then it simply flows into the ventricle, which then pushes it through the aorta and circulates throughout the body. So because the atrium and the ventricle are connected like this, we have oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mixing, okay, coming from the pulmonary and the systemic circulation. In amphibians, there's a partial separation of the atria from the pulmonary and systemic circulation, but they're still mixing in the ventricle. And then finally, in the reptiles, we start to get a partial separation into two different ventricles, so that prevents that um, mixing of the blood to some degree, so lesser and more depending upon the types of reptiles. And then finally, in mammals, we have a four-chambered heart where you get complete separation of the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood of the pulmonary and the circulatory system. So it's a very linear, sequential arrangement where you've had the evolution of the chambers of the heart to prevent the mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood as you go up through the higher vertebrates. It's a very nice story. And you're going to, I think um, Dr. Uh, who teaches you um, at Myers, Dr. Myers, I think, gives you more of this. He likes to talk about it. OK, structure of the heart. If we look at the structure of the heart, it, it is composed of cardiac muscle cells, OK? 
which are different to both smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. And I think Dr. Andrews gives you muscle next week, right? You haven't had muscle yet? No, so he'll give it to you next week. So he'll show you the difference between the different types of, of muscle fibers, but it's a different type of muscle cell built around a cardiac skeleton, which is basically very dense collagen. And we have three layers of the heart, the endocardium, the myocardium, and the epicardium. All of those three layers are homologous to the three layers of blood vessels, the intima media adventitia. Okay, they're homologous. So if we look at a, a section through the wall of a heart, the innermost layer is the endocardium, analogous to the innermost layer of blood vessels being the intima. The middle layer, of the muscle layer, is the myocardium, analogous to the middle layer of blood vessels being the media. And the outer layer is the epicardium, analogous to the outer layer of blood vessels being the adventitia. Okay? That's the three layers. And then the whole heart sits in a sac, okay? And the outer wall of the sac is called the pericardium. Okay, so if you look at this schematic of a section through the heart, we can always distinguish the atria from the ventricles, because the ventricles are the those chambers that squeeze the blood into the systemic or pulmonary circulation. So they've got to have the thickest layer of muscle to do the work of pushing the blood through the body or the lungs, whereas the atria are basically pushing blood into the ventricles. They're just passing it on. So the thickness of the, the myocardium of the atria is much thinner because it's just pushing it into the ventricle. The ventricles have a much thicker layer of myocardium because they're pushing it around the body, either the pulmonary or systemic circulation. So then we, this is a valve, so and this pointing from the atria to the ventricle, so we can call this then the atrioventricular valve, coming from the atrium in the direction of the ventricle. Okay? And then the inner layer would be the endocardium, middle layer myocardium, outer layer epicardium. Okay, sometimes, oh, okay. Now, on the inner aspect of the wall of the blood vessel, just underneath the endocardium, <coughs> we find Purkinje fibers. And Purkinje fibers are those specialized cardiac muscle cells that conduct a wave of depolarization to stimulate the contraction of the myocardium of the heart. Okay? Sometimes this is what Purkinje fibers look like, okay, between the endocardium and the myocardium right here. Sometimes they're confused with adipose tissue, so don't confuse the two. And that's the epicardium containing adipose tissue. So that's the outer surface. This is the inner surface containing Purkinje fibers. So Purkinje fibers lining the inner aspect of the chambers of the heart um, are responsible for causing the contraction of the myocardium. So what happens is we have the sinoatrial node. It's a node that's considered the pacemaker of the heart. It's continually generating an electrical impulse. It can be slowed up or um, slowed down, but it never stops. If it stops, the person dies. So the SA node can, uh, can, can creates an electrical impulse that then passes to the AV node. The AV node then is connected to uh, the so-called bundles of his, which are these bundles of specialized um, Purkinje fibers. And then this wave of depolarization passes all the way down the bundle of his to the apex of the heart, the pointy part, where we have um, <coughs> connections then of um, the, the uh, cardiac muscle cells, the Purkinje fibers to the cardiac muscle cells. And so the wave of depolarization, it starts from the apex and pushes the blood back towards the large blood vessels. Okay? So the, the impulse comes down here, it stimulates the cardiac muscle cells at the, the apex, the pointy part, to contract and then the wave of depolarization passes back towards the larger blood vessels like the, um, the, uh, the, the, the aorta. And that way you're squeezing the blood from the tip back out to the aorta for circulation around the body. You wouldn't want the opposite, right? You wouldn't want the wave of depolarization to start here and go towards the apex because basically you would blow the end of the heart open, right? Because the pointy part, if you're pushing the blood into the pointy part at the end, it's going to explode. So you've got to start 
the squeezing of the heart from the pointy part, the apex, back towards the aorta. Okay? And that is done through this wave of depolarization from the um, cardiac muscle cells, the so-called specialized cardiac muscle cells, the Purkinje fibers, which are in the bundles of his. Okay, now let's look at, so we've looked at the blood vessels of the circulatory system, arteries, veins, and smaller vessels. We've looked at the structure of the heart. Now let's look at lymphatic vessels. So lymphatic vessels are a parallel unidirectional circulatory system that is basically collecting fluid from the body, the tissues and organs, and draining back into the venous system. So it's in parallel to the circulatory system and drains back into the venous component of the circulatory system. We can see it here. So here's our pulmonary and systemic circulatory system, lungs and body. Here's in parallel our lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes. Remember the lymph nodes <coughs> filter the fluid passing through the lymphatic vessels. And lymphatic vessels have valves because it's unidirectional, shown here. Okay, so about 10% of the fluid is returned from the lymphatic vessels. And of course they can also transport a few compounds um, back into the um, the, the, the systemic circular system as well. And of course, as the lymphatic vessel is very important in immune surveillance. So this just shows you some, in green, the blind ending lymphatic vessels. They're kind of like just everywhere, there's finger-like projections so that fluid can drain into them and drain back through larger and larger lymphatic vessels eventually to the largest of the veins. So. How do we recognize a lymphatic vessel from a vein? Okay, because they, they, they would probably look very similar. Well, the easiest way to recognize a lymphatic vessel from a vein is that the lymphatic vessel contains lymphocytes, but no red blood cells, right? Whereas the vein is going to contain mostly red blood cells and maybe and, and a few leukocytes. So if you compare, this is a lymphatic vessel, you can see what is here. These are all lymphocytes, right? They're all nucleated cells. Do you see any red blood cells here? Not a one, okay? Not a one. And also it's got a valve. So you might think this is either a vein or a lymphatic vessel because it's got a valve. But it's got lymphocytes in it, so and, mo and only lymphocytes, no red blood cells. It's got to be a lymphatic vessel. This blood vessel here, very thin walled, looks like just a tunica intermediate, and that's it but filled with red blood cells, it's got to be a vein, okay? So that's the way you distinguish between the two, depending upon the presence or absence of lymphocytes, for the most part, versus red blood cells. Okay, so these, these are just some pictures. Here's a capillary. This, they're saying this is a lymphatic vessel, but that's not definitive, actually, because you can't see any cell types in there. They, I guess they just knew it was from other tissues around it. Okay, so remember, um, in line with all the lymphatic vessels are lymph nodes, and all these lymph nodes filter, they get filtered um, lymphatic fluid at least once. The fluid gets filtered at least once by a, lymphatic, uh, by a lymph node before it returns to the venous system. And, of course, they're very important in pathology. They can be um, sampled for metastatic tumor cells um, during surgery. Yeah? Hmm? It's just the fluid that's bathing all the tissues. Okay? It's the, the, tish, the fluid that's in the, um, the loose connective tissue, the lamina propria, um, everything. Because remember, everything's held together by connective tissue. And all of those, there's cells in that connective tissue as well as the extracellular matrix components, and they've got to get nutrients, right? So the fluid is just bathing. It's just fluid that's bathing all of the tissues. Okay. So let's look at a few clinical examples. Now, also for my exam, my clinical examples and my evolutionary slides are not on the exam, okay? 
So don't sweat those clinicals or revolutionary slides. They're more for relevance, okay, in explanation. So here's a couple, here's a clinical example, myocardial, myocardial infarction, heart attack, right? Heart attack. Look at this blood vessel, clogged, right? Coronary artery, an artery of the of the of the heart, it's all clogged up. Okay, then some of the, um, the 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 muscle, the cardiac muscle fibers then die, and um, person dies from a heart attack. This now here's a berry aneurysm in the brain. See, this is a blood vessel, and it looks like the tunica media is um, blown out here. This is kind of like a balloon, little balloon um, blowout, kind of like the uh, the inner tube of a bicycle tire kind of blowing out, right? Similar sort of concept where the tunica media um, is weak in this particular case, maybe because that person had high blood pressure and they've got this aneurysm, so then they have this um, leakage of blood into the brain, which of course is going to mess with um, neuronal function, and then the person has a stroke, or this is a common cause of stroke, or um, other. Um, problems. Okay, just some statistics. 32% of cardiovascular deaths, okay, due to restricted blood supply or stroke, those two examples I gave you, are due to tobacco use, okay? So people that smoke tobacco, heavy tobacco use, um, don't just get lung cancer. Lung, you think of lung cancer when you think of smokers, They've got all sorts of problems. Man, they've got so many problems, they don't even realize it. And one of them is cardiovascular, okay? Because the, um, the blood vessels get, you know, they get plaque, they get clogged up with crud, okay? And then, um, it's, it's, you know, tobacco users typically have high blood pressure, okay? So, you know, here, lung cancer, sure, but also heart disease, they can get um, difficulty breathing, Right, because the lungs are clogged up with um, all that crud that they've been smoking for years. Stroke, other cancers, um, also associated with smoking. So, smoking is the number one cause of preventable illnesses in the USA and many other countries. It's in in uh, actually in Iceland, it's um, it's a restricted drug. You can't you can't buy cigarettes or tobacco products in Iceland. If you were, this they passed this law about 10 years ago. So if you were a user and you were addicted, which most, many heavy smokers are, you have to get a prescription from your physician and go to the pharmacy to get your tobacco product, okay? But no, you can't get it, so no teenagers are getting hooked on tobacco, right? And they've got fantastic health in Iceland, you know, because they don't smoke. You can't buy tobacco there. So they've kind of caught on to the idea that this is the most preventable way to uh, maintain the health of um, the population and also helps out in the budget, right? Because they don't have um, medical issues associated with smoking. I stole this slide from the wall of the aquarium in um, Key West. Anybody been to Key West in Florida? Did you go to the aquarium? You didn't go to the aquarium at the very end, the piers? If you went to the aquarium, it's nice. You know, they've got some sharks and they've got turtles and fish and stuff. This is the very end of Key West. You know, if you keep walking, you're into the ocean. So this, and I thought, this is a good slide. Look at this slide. They've got, because they, they were really interested about shark attacks. You know, people are freaking out about shark attacks. What, what are your chances of dying from a shark attack? Not much, all right, compared to all these other things. But when you look at, the, look at what up here, what is this? Heart disease, cancer, stroke, all those things are caused by, by tobacco use, right? The number one, two, and three, tobacco use. You can, so this kind of caught my eye. Then you've got all this other stuff in the middle, but the biggies up here, tobacco use, don't worry about sharks. You'll be safe, hopefully. Hmm? Freshwater snails kill more people? It wouldn't surprise me. Okay, varicose veins. So sometimes when people get older, you know, the veins pop out on their legs, and that's because of valve insufficiency. The valves aren't working very well. 
so the blood actually can pop through the valves and go backwards and so the blood accumulates. So this, you know, this um, is pretty treatable. Surgeons can remove those veins and help out um, with people with varicose veins. Okay, there you go. That's the cardiovascular system. So here we go. Here's our question. A narrow blood vessel contains six layers of smooth muscle and it's classified as six layers of smooth muscle. All right. Okay, there you go. An arteriole would be five or less. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's not complete. It's some blood's going through, but some blood, blood can be squeezed backwards. In the, you mean in the varicose veins? So what's the question then? It's because there's two flaps like this. And so the blood pushes open the flaps as it's going this way. And then, but if you, but if your blood is pushed backwards, it pushes down here and it causes the flaps to kind of arch like this and closes the tip. Okay? Yes. This is a distributing an elastic. Um, elastic artery is the largest of the arteries. That would be like the aorta, so it's huge. So it's going to have, and I also say a narrow blood vessel, right? So if it was an elastic artery, it would be huge like the aorta. So it can't be an elastic artery because that would be the largest of the blood vessels, of the arteries. So that's, you know, that's, so narrow also comes into that. So then, you know, what's left is the distributing and it's not an arteriole because it's got six layers. Was there another question back there? Has that answered the question? Okay, let's take a five minute break and we'll do the lab. Pardon? Okay, so let's take our seats. Let's look at some examples of um, the different components of the cardiovascular system that we just looked at. And uh, so here we have a whole mount of some blood vessels. So this actually is pretty informative. So if you look at C here, this vessel here, we can't see through it, right? So that tells us that perhaps that the wall of this blood vessel is relatively thick. Right, so that would then maybe suggest to us, because it's got a thick wall, tunica media, that perhaps that's an artery. Whereas this companion vessel right next to it is pretty big, but we can see right through the wall there and we can see um, the cells within that blood vessel. So that suggests to us that that's a vein, right? So then we can follow the blood. So we've got the artery, which is C, and then we get into this arteriole, which is E, and then smaller blood vessel. The next level would be just one diameter of a blood vessel of a red blood cell A, which would be a capillary. And then it goes into this vein, which is pretty wide. And if we follow the vein, it's smaller down into this venule, which would be D. Right. So it kind of makes sense if you follow from the thickest wall of C 
through the various blood vessels and looking at whether you can see through them or not and the diameter of those blood vessels you can distinguish between the arterial and venous components of these blood vessels. Any questions? Okay, and then we can see the same thing here. You can see here, we can see through all of these blood vessels, right? Another whole mount. You can see um, this is the venous system, venules and veins, um, capillaries of these blood vessels in this whole mount. No, we wouldn't say there are any arteries there because we can see through everything. Okay, now here's a large blood vessel stain for elastic fibers. See all of these elastic fibers? Okay, so this would be a large, a larger elastic artery. Okay, and then here we have an artery and a vein next to each other. Now remember I talked about companion blood vessels. You've got an artery and a vein of comparable size, right? We're not talking about an artery and a capillary. We're talking about an artery and a vein. And if we look at the artery, you can see it's kind of held open. The lumen's open. This vein is collapsed because this has higher blood pressure. And this has lower blood pressure, at least initially when it was sampled, presumably. And also in this artery, you can see a very thick tunica media right here. Here, we don't see any tunica media in the vein. So by comparing companion blood vessels, arteries and veins, we can get an idea of which one's the artery and which one's the vein. Yeah. Because of the blood pressure, the artery, um, this is a relatively large artery, so it would be under higher blood pressure and it would keep the vessel open, right? And plus it's also got the tunica media here, which will act as, you know, structural support, whereas the vein is under low blood pressure and it doesn't have that tunica media so the, the lumen is just going to collapse. Yeah. Is it always what? Usually, yeah. I'm not going to say always because you never know what you might see but under most circumstances, yes. Okay, all right, so here is a smaller artery. So if we count the number of smooth muscle cells, that's six or more. So that would be the tunica media. We can see the internal elastic lamina is quite prominent. We can see a not so prominent external elastic lamina, and then that would be the adventitia. So again over here, the internal elastic lamina in blue, the media, smooth muscle, and then the adventitia on the outside. Okay, and here's again two blood vessels, artery and vein companion, right? Again, you can, I think now you can kind of get the idea of the artery has the more open um, lumen, usually a more prominent internal elastic artery. Media, we can pick out quite clearly, whereas the, ad, whereas the vein, okay, we don't really see a media, very, might, might be one or two cells of smooth muscle there. That's about it because the adventitia is the thickest of veins, the lumen is collapsed. Okay, here's this same blood vessel probably looped over like this. Okay, any questions here? So we'll always look for the companion blood vessels. So here's a medium-sized artery, so the intima, media, and adventitia out here. You can see the internal elastic lamina. You can kind of make out the external elastic lamina here. Okay, getting higher in magnification. So here's the lumen, internal elastic lamina, media, external elastic lamina, adventitia. Okay, questions? Okay, and then I'm getting into some larger blood vessels, the intima, media, adventitia. And now we can see some small blood vessels in the adventitia. So we call these small blood vessels in the adventitia the vasa vasora, vasa vasora, vessels within the vessels, vasa vasora, vessels within the vessels. Okay, yeah. Um, 
these are also elastic fibers, right? Because remember, larger arteries will have um, elastic fibers in them, so especially like the aorta, okay? And then going smaller, you'll still have some. And then as you get to the smaller arteries, you may or may not have elastic fibers within the media. Okay, so here's a um, vein. You can see the lumens collapsed. We can see the internal elastic lamina. There's really no media at all in this one. It's all adventitia. And of course, we can also see the vasa vesora, the vessels within the vessels, the vessels within the adventitia of this vein. Uh, here's a valve. Okay. So if we looked at this and I showed you this, and I said, is this a is this a uh, lymphatic vessel or is it a vein? The answer would be it's a vein because these are red blood cells. These are all red blood cells here, right? There'd be no red blood cells if it was a lymphatic vessel. And here's the valve of this particular vein. They're probably lymphocytes. You still, you know, blood's still got leukocytes in it, right? And actually, these look like they're outside of the vessel. These look like they're in the connective tissue space for whatever reason. Yes, like here, see here? But it would be all this and none of this. Okay, so if you look at an electron micrograph of an arteriole, here's the endothelial cell layer and here's one or two or three layers of smooth muscle. So this would be an electron micrograph of an arteriole. Okay, small blood vessels. So um, D is a capillary, just wide enough for a red blood cell or leukocyte to fit through. C, we can count at least one, maybe two layers of endothelial cells. So this would be an arteriole. Here's another arteriole, less than six layers of smooth muscle. And here's the companion venule that goes with it. Okay. Okay, here's another slide. Capillary arteriole venule. So here's the capillary, just big enough for a red blood cell to fit through. Here's an arteriole because we can count, looks like one, maybe two layers of smooth muscle. And here's the companion vein, slightly larger lumen, but no smooth muscle. So if you look at the relative size of the structures and look at the companions, quite often you can pick out and distinguish one of the blood vessels based upon what the other blood vessels look like. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this one's so small it just didn't collapse. Yeah. And sometimes they might, you know, just by a fluke stay open a little bit. Okay, so in cross section, oh, pardon me, in longitudinal section, here's an arteriole, here's the lumen you can see here, the layers of smooth muscle, and here's the companion venule, lumen's a bit wider, but there's no tunica media, it's all adventitia, okay? So this is the arteriole, this is the venule right here, companion vessels. Okay, another arteriole in longitudinal section is one, looks like one layer of smooth muscle. One is enough, one to five, it's an arteriole. Here's another in longitudinal section, this looks like it may be one to two layers of smooth muscle in the tunica media, okay, less than five, more than zero, makes it an arteriole. Here's another arteriole in electron microscopic view, one, two layers of smooth muscle, it's an arteriole. Okay, capillary, okay, no smooth muscle. And look at that cell in there. If you didn't read the, the what it is at the bottom, you would know that that's a monocyte, right? Because there's not anything else, and the shape of the nucleus is kind of weird, um, so that would make it a monocyte. Okay, here we have a capillary winding its way through this whole mounted tissue. And it looks like a, a dipocyte. Okay, looking at different capillaries, this is a continuous capillary. The endothelial cell forms a continuous layer around the lumen, okay? As opposed to a fenestrated capillary, the arrows are pointing to the fenestrations 
um, with the diaphragm spanning the fenestrations. Any questions so far? Another continuous capillary, and this has got a big red blood cell in it, filling the whole space of the continuous capillary. And another la slightly larger continuous capillary, kind of containing an oblique section of a red blood cell. Another continuous capillary, lined by endothelial cell. Sinusoids, okay, wider lumen. They'll have spaces between the endothelial cells, and you can see that here. So here's the sinusoid. You can see these spaces in the walls and between the walls of the endothelial cells right here, okay? So that would be a sinusoid. Okay, larger blood vessel, the aorta. So here's the intima, and this is all media, right? Very thick. And then this is the boundary of the adventitia. And if we stain that with for elastic fibers, you can see the tunica media is filled with all of these elastic fibers, right? Because it's under high blood pressure, it's expanding and contracting continuously. So that would be one of the largest of the arterial vessels like the aorta coming straight out of the heart. Conversely, the vena cava draining all of that blood back into the heart. This is the lumen up here. This layer here is the tunica media, and this is the adventitia, and you can see the blocks of smooth muscle in the adventitia running perpendicular to the smooth muscle of the tunica media. So that is one of the hallmarks of the vena cava type blood vessel, having smooth muscle running perpendicular in the adventitia relative to the media. Questions? Okay, slightly high power view now. So again, vena cava, here's the lumen. Here's the tunica media, right? Smooth muscle running this way, circumferentially. And now you can see perpendicular bundles of smooth muscle in the adventitia from here going out, bundles of smooth muscle. So these are running in and out of the board. These are running circumferentially around the board. And then here we have a vasa vasora, vessel within the vessel. Questions? Vasa vasora, yeah, all the arrows are vasa vasora. They're all blood vessels. Okay, here's the heart. Remember, the three layers of the heart are analogous to the three layers of blood vessels. So we've got endocardium, myocardium, epicardium. And the thickest wall would be the ventricle, the thinner would be the atria. And then this valve is running from the atria into the ventricle, so this would be an atrioventricular valve. We can see coronary artery, coronary vein within the connective, connective tissue space of the epicardium. Here's another um, view, high power view of the AV valve. So again, thickest um, cardiac muscle layer is in the ventricle, not so much in the atrium. So this valve is running from the atria in the direction of the ventricle, so that's an AV valve. This is the inner surface, because that's where the valve is, endocardium, myocardium, epicardium, and we've got a um, coronary artery. That's the thing that gets clogged up when people have heart attacks, myocardial, myocardial infarction, okay? Gets clogged, smokers, okay, they're clogging up their coronary arteries. They do bypass, when they're bypassing their bypassing a clogged artery from one location to another where you can get good circulation. Companion, yeah. Yeah, so you've got the, the artery and the vein here, companion. They're not always companion, but a lot of the times they are. Okay, so here's the aortic valve, so the blood's left the ventricle, left ventricle, left the left ventricle going into the aorta, and you can see here's the valve in the aorta, so that the blood doesn't flow back into the heart under high pressure. Purkinje valve, Purkinje fibers, well, okay, Purkinje fibers in the, um, the 
endocardium or just just yeah just beneath the endocardium in the connective tissue so these are specialized cardiac muscle cells that have been um, specialized to conduct a wave of depolarization for the contraction of the heart so these are kind of oblique these are kind of in cross section sometimes these can be a little bit difficult to identify but if you know the location and you can see the nuclei in them okay then you should be able to pick them up and not confuse them with adipose tissue in the epicardium. Okay, so we've seen this one before, lymphatic vessel. So this is a vein because we can see red blood cells. This is a lymphatic vessel because we can see only lymphocytes. There are no um, red blood cells in that blood vessel. Okay? It does have a valve, but it doesn't have any red blood cells, so it's got to be a lymphatic vessel. Any questions? Okay, there you go. Quest the the um, question. Basically, name this blood vessel. What is it? Not in high power. I don't. Um, I didn't get into that. That's cardiology. Um, but you know, you, if you want to look at it, you can look at it online. I, I think one of the slide that I had had a little low power view of them. There was a picture of those no nodes um, in one of the slides at relatively low power. Um, but I, I don't get into that. That's beyond this lecture. Okay. Any last questions? So let's let's take a break on the hour at noon. We're going to start. Integument, which is basically skin and its specializations. Okay, so take our seats and let's now completely change subjects or at least topics and do the integument. So the integument is a word that basically describes the skin and its specializations. Okay, so first we're going to look at the structure of the skin, then some glands and some specializations such as hair and nails and things like that. So here we have a schematic picture of the integument, which consists of the outermost layer, which is called the epidermis. Beneath the epidermis is the connective tissue layer, which is the dermis. 
embedded within which we can find various glands and specializations such as here. And then beneath the dermis, we have a layer of adipose tissue called the hypodermis, but this is not part of the integument. Okay? The hypodermis, even though the name implies it's part of the dermis, it's a part of the integument, it's not. Hypodermis is adipose tissue, also called superficial fascia by gross anatomists. That's the superficial fascia, but it's not part of the integument. Okay? So don't get tricked on that one. Okay, so if we look at the phylogeny of integumentary specialization, it's kind of interesting. So if we go back to our primitive vertebrates um, like fish and amphibians, these critters have dermal scales on the surface, scales formed by the dermis. They don't have an epidermis, they have dermal scales. And if you look at a cross, so you know, fish have scales, right? You know, fish scale, I'm talking about fish scales here. They're bigger, small, some of them are really, really small. Like if you feel the surface of a shark or something, it feels like sandpaper, they're just like super small scales. But if you do a cross section through one of these scales and you look at the structure, you'll see that it has the same structure as teeth, right? There's got, it's got enamel and it's got dentin on the inside. It's got similar structure as teeth. That's why these dermal scales are called denticles. So you can imagine that that's where the evolution of teeth came from. You had these denticles, these scales on the surface of aquatic vertebrates, and they just moved into the oral cavity. They got bigger, voila, you got teeth, right? Just like a shark, right? A shark's got these rows of teeth, rows of denticles, you know, many of them. So that's, that's um, kind of interesting in terms of the origin of teeth. Then when you get to terrestrial vertebrates, then we get the evolution of the epidermis, the outer layer, okay? And that is really an adaptation for desiccation. That prevents um, evaporative loss, a greater evaporative loss. Cause, and, that, and that's associated with the development of a stratum corneum. And then some of those, some, some of those epidermal structures actually can um, have evolved into feathers. We see feathers in dinosaurs and birds, right? Birds are very closely related to dinosaurs. And the more and more they find fine fossils of dinosaurs, the more and more they see feathers on them. So it turns out probably most dinosaurs had feathers to some degree, maybe for display, not all over the body, maybe around the neck. You know, just kind of like, you know, some birds have display feathers. Some dinosaurs probably had display feathers as well to, for recognition of gender and stuff like that. And then, um, so that's some specializations from the epidermis. In addition, the epidermis gives rise to hair and nails. And also, um, the apric and sweat glands um, are thought to have evolved into mammary glands. So that's the origin of a lot of these different structures memory glands, hair, nail, feathers, all are related to integumentary specializations. Okay, so if we look at integument, basically skin, there's two types that we describe. We describe thick skin and thin skin. Most of the body is covered with thin skin, and in a few locations we have thick skin, like the palms of the hand, the soles of the feet, areas where there's a lot of abrasion and wear and tear, right? And thick skin has um, a dis this distinguishing features of a thicker stratum corneum and the presence of a stratum lucidum, which is absent in thin skin. And we're going to come back to that. So just remember, thick skin has a thicker stratum corneum and the presence of a stratum lucidum. First, we're going to look at the cells of the epidermis, so we're on the outermost layer, the epidermis. Most of the cells of the epidermis are keratinocytes. And sprinkled amongst all these layers of keratinocytes, we have Langerhans cells, which is derived from monocytes. So this suggests it's a kind of an antigen-presenting cell, right? A very early immune immunoresponder. If some bacteria is breaking through the skin, it could come into contact with a Langerhans cell and mount an immune response. We have Merkel cells, which are associated with um, nerves, so these are thought to be sensory. And then we have melanocytes, which give rise to the pigmentation of the skin. So first, let's talk about keratinocytes, which are all the different layers um, of, the, in, of the epidermis. And keratinocytes 
contain an abundance of keratin fibers. Remember keratin fibers, intermediate filaments? That's why they're called keratinocytes. They've got a lot of keratin fibers in them. And they're connected to each other by desmosomes. And all of these keratinocytes are layered in the epidermis. So at the very bottom of the epidermis, adjacent to the dermis, is the stratum basal. The next layer above that is the stratum spinosum, which has a different histological appearance because it has a spiny appearance. Then the next layer above that is the stratum granulosum because these granulocytes have granules in them. Then in thick skin we'll have a stratum lucidum and both in thick skin and thin skin we'll have a stratum corneum. So these are the different layers of the epidermis derived from different types of keratinocytes. So here are the layers showing in thick, thick skin. So, at the, so from here to here is the epidermis, okay, from here to here. Below is the dermis. So the stratum basal is the, the basal layer of the epidermis. Above the stratum basal is the stratum spinosum, which has this spiny appearance of the keratinocytes. And then above the stratum basal, a uh, stratum spinosum is the stratum granulosum. These keratinocytes have granules in them. These are the three living cell layers. Then above the granulosum, we have a dead cell layer, which appears somewhat um, clear, which we call the stratum lucidum, only present in thick skin. And then above that, we have the stratum corneum, which consists of the dead squames of cells on the surface of the skin. And the stratum corneum is thicker in thick skin, thinner in thin skin. So there are the five layers of the epidermis. Five of those layers are in thick skin. Four of those layers are in thin skin. Okay, so let's look at the cells of those layers. The bottommost layer, the stratum basal, is attached to the basement membrane of that separates the epidermis from the dermis. So remember, these cells, the um, keratinocytes, are connected for the most part to each other by desmosomes. And remember, cadherins are the um, proteins in, that are um, a distinguishing feature of desmosomes connected to the, the bridges except the hemidesmosomes of the basement membrane have cadherins replaced with integrins, okay? And if you go way back to lecture number two, um, you might have studied that by now. You may remember I talked about integrins replacing cadherins in hemidesmosomes versus desmosomes, okay? So the next layer above the basal is the spinosum, the spiny cell layer. And this layer of cells derives its name as an artifact of tissue shrinkage during preparation. So what happens is, you know, when you take a piece of tissue for preparation of histological slides, first you fix it, you know, formaldehyde, whatever, glitteraldehyde, and then you dehydrate it, usually in alcohol, to remove all the water. And during that dehydration process, the cytoplasm shrinks somewhat. And, but remember that the keratinocytes are held together by desmosomes. So some of the cytoplasm will shrink away from the other cytoplasm of the adjacent cell, but, in, but the rest of the cell will be held together to the other cell by a desmosome. So where we have the desmosomes holding onto the adjacent cell, we get the appearance of these, this spiny layer, which is because the desmosomes holding onto each other. Hence, stratum spinosum gets its name as a, as a function of an artifact of tissue preparation. Okay, so here we see, you can see the um, keratin fibers, desmosomes holding onto each other and the rest of the cytoplasm shrinking away, giving this spiny appearance, hence the term stratum spinosum. Okay, then the third living cell layer going up higher out to the outer surface of the body that the third and last living cell layer is the stratum granulosum. So the stratum granulosum gets its name because it has granules in the cytoplasm of the cells. These granules are the keratohyalin granules. These are not membrane bound. And lamella granules, which are membrane coated. And the lamella granules contain lipids and compounds that form an intercellular cement. So the lamella granules are secreted 
between the cells and helps to act as a barrier to um, water, because the lipids are um, hydrophobic, and um, also as a glue to hold the cells together somewhat. Hence the term stratum granulosum because of those two different types of granules within those keratinocytes. Okay, so that was the three layer, living cell layers. Then the next layer up um, in thick skin is the stratum lucidum, which is kind of a clear layer where the um, squames have been compressed. And then the outermost layer is the stratum corneum, which is just the dead keratinocytes on the outer surface of the skin. So these can be sloughed off, you know, abrasion, so on. Um, and because they're dead, you know, it doesn't affect the body in any way. And also, they kind of lay it on you and held together, so they also contribute as a barrier to desiccation and also a barrier to bugs getting into you, right? So a bacteria or a virus might land on one of these guys, and he says, great, I found a, a host, but it's a dead cell. Okay, sorry, can't do much with a dead cell, right? The squam is dead, so the bacteria or the, the virus aren't going to be able to invade that cell, especially a virus. It's not going to be able to get in that cell and take it over to make more viruses. So in that way also it helps to protect the body from foreign pathogens. So here's a comparison of thin skin and thick skin. Again, the basal spinosum granulosum, the living cell layers are present in all three. The stratum lucidum is this clear layer, the first of the dead cell layers. We only see in thick skin. The stratum corneum is present in thick skin and thick skin, but the corneum is much thicker in thick skin and not so much in thin skin. Okay, so now I want to talk about fingerprints. Fingerprints are unique to individuals. They're called dermatoglyphs or fingerprints in common usage, except um, in identical twins. So identical twins have almost identical fingerprints. You get slight variations, you know, because of the nature aspect, you know, nurture nature, you're familiar with that concept, nature versus nurture, right? So, you know, the when they're born, the fingerprints would be almost identical, but because of just the the, the process of living and and um, wear and tear on the fingers and environmental factors and things like that, you're gonna get slight variations in the um, finger um, print pattern over time. Um, but for the most part, um, they'll be similar in identical twins, but everybody else has a unique set of fingerprints, right? So um, they, that is very useful, of course, in law enforcement or identification. Like I went, I went to get my, um, uh, the uh, what's that thing where it lets you get onto airplanes with a gun through security? What is it? Yeah, TSA pre-check, yeah. Thank you, I blanked on that one. TSA pre-check, so when I went to get my TSA pre-check, they did a fingerprint of me. But they, they don't do ink anymore, it's just stick it on a piece of glass and roll it, you know, and that's it. So I had all my, I think you did all 10 fingers, actually, for the TSA pre-check. So, you know, identification, that's great, you know. I passed some, they mustn't have caught up with my past. I hid that pretty well. They gave me the, the, the pass, so now I'm good to get onto planes and bypass most other people that are taking off their shoes, finding water bottles, getting that line over there. There's a bottle there, all that hassle. Okay, fingerprints. Functions of the epidermis. So epidermis, outermost layer of the skin, abrasion resistance, we talked about that, okay. I'm rubbing my hands together. You know, they're dead cells, so I'm not sacrificing any living cells. So, um, and it's also a physical barrier to desiccation, partial. Waterproofing, you know, when, it, when I get rained on, water doesn't go into my body, it kind of float, ro rolls off. So, functions of epidermis. Okay, so that's the keratinocytes and the layers of keratinocytes within the epidermis. The next cell that I want to talk about are melanocytes, which typically we see at the level of the stratum basal. And these are the cells that give rise to pigmentation. So melanocytes synthesize <coughs> melanin, which is packaged into granules. So the biochemistry of this is um, the enzyme teracinase converts dopa into dopaquinone into melanin, okay? And um, most people 
have eumelanin um, in their melanocytes. Red-headed people have a slight, slight biochemical variant called pheomelanin. That's why they, they have red hair as opposed to perhaps darker hair. And they tend to be fairer in complexion as opposed to everybody else. So it turns out then that once these melanin granules mature and um, accumulate melanin, they are then transported to the tips of these finger-like projections and they are injected into adjacent keratinocytes. So here's our maturing uh, melanin granules. Finally, they have um, concentration of melanin in the granule. And here we can see these melanin granules being secreted into an adjacent keratinocyte. Okay, so this finger-like projection of the of the um, melanocyte then buds off into this adjacent keratinocyte, leading to accumulation of melanin in this adjacent keratinocyte. So the keratinocytes are accumulating melanin granules from a melanocyte. And it turns out that these melanin granules tend, as they're secreted into adjacent cells, tend to accumulate in the cytoplasm between the nucleus and incident light. Okay? So the melanin granules, in fact, are acting as a barrier to sunlight to protect the DNA from ultraviolet damage radiation, UV radiation damage. You can see that here. So here's the nucleus of these cells. Here's our melanin granules, and this is the direction of light coming in here. And you can see these melanin granules have aligned themselves in the cytoplasm between the nucleus and the incident sunlight. So they're blocking ultraviolet radiation to some extent from damaging DNA. Yeah. Yes. As the melanin granules mature in the melanocytes, they get darker. And then once they're secreted, that's it. That's the final melanin granule. But it doesn't get any darker once it's secreted. All that maturation occurs within the melanocyte. OK? So a couple of miscellaneous characteristics. Skin color is attributed to the amount of melanin not the number of melanocytes. So you, you know, we're all, we're all different colors here, but we all would have pretty much the same number of melanocytes, but those of us with a darker complexion probably have more active melanocytes, making more melanin, as opposed to other people. Albinism, an albino, doesn't have a functional um, tyrosinase enzyme. Remember, tyrosinase is the first of the enzymes that converts the, um, the dopaquinone into dopa. Okay, so um, then because they don't have tyrosinase enzyme, they can't make melanin, and then so then they have a very fair complexion. The pink color that you see is the blood color reflection of blood in the underneath the integument. And then we also have cancers of the skin, which um, are the most common types of skin cancers. I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so that's melanocytes gives rise to pigmentation of the skin. Next cell type I want to talk about briefly are Langerhans cells. These are derived from monocytes. So they are an antigen presenting cell. Okay, So that's going to be an immune surveillance type cell. So if some bacteria or virus somehow breaks its way through these keratinocytes, it may come into contact with a Langerhans cell that can immediately react and mount an immune response. Okay. That's all I have to say about Langerhans cells. Then the, yeah. So the Langerhans cells, um, don't they differentiate between macrophages that they're not The Langerhans cells, they, they stay as Langerhans cells. They're just, they're variant, right? Because we group them into a group of category of cells called antigen presenting cells, which originally were derived from monocytes. But once they differentiate into their final product, they can be Langerhans cells. They can be Kupfer cells of the liver that Dr. Anders will talk about. They can be glial cells of the brain that Dr. Anders will talk about. They can be osteoclasts of bone, right, the multinucleated clasts. So that's the final differentiation product. But they started out as monocytes. In this case, the Langerhans cells started out as 
a monocyte. Merkel cells, okay, this is sensory. Quite often you see them associated with a nerve of some sort. So you can see this Merkel cell here. It has these dense core granules, which is reminiscent of neurotransmitter granules, okay? And it's a, a, a budding next to a nerve ending. So then we think that Merkel cells play a sensory role in the skin. Okay, skin cancers, um, the most common cancer that people get, different types. There's um, squamous cell and basal cell carcinoma. So when they say squamous cell, that means keratinocyte or basal cell of the stratum basal. These are the not so aggressive kinds and these are readily cured. The, the trick um, with all cancers, um, certainly with skin cancer, is early diagnosis and treatment. You know, it's on the outside, you see it, okay, get rid of it. And then chances of survival is very high. The more aggressive type of the melanomas, which can uh, metastasize into the body more readily than the squamous cell and basal cell. And um, these tend to account for a higher number of deaths of skin cancers due to skin cancers. But again, if it's diagnosed early, you can get rid of it and prognosis is good. We've got some other types of um, skin cancers that are that you see. Merkel cell, Carposi sarcoma is that weird one that people with AIDS virus get. Um, and then some other types here. These are pretty rare. Most of the time it's squamous cell, basal cell, or melanoma. Okay, now there's a nice correlation between the incidence of the various types of skin cancer and exposure to UV radiation as determined by geography. So if you live in Seattle, where it rains 366 days of the year, then you never see the sunlight and you're not going to get a high incidence of skin cancer. If you live in Albuquerque, where it's sunny a good part of the year, you're getting exposed to much more UVB radiation and so your incidence of skin cancer is higher. Okay, So there's a nice correlation between exposure to ultraviolet radiation and geographical location. Okay, this guy was a truck driver for his whole life. And on the, the left side, this side, that was against the window. So against the window, he was getting fried by sunlight all the time while he was driving around. This was the side inside the cabin, okay, not exposed to sunlight. So you can see sunlight exposure to ultraviolet radiation causes wrinkling and damage to the skin, okay? Thought to be, um, it, it causes the way that the connective tissue components in the dermis are laid down, okay? The, the collagen fibers and all that sort of stuff is more randomly arranged. So, you, you know, when they say put on your sunscreen, it's not just to protect you from getting cancer, it's also you know, from a, from a vain point of view, keep you looking better in your older age, right? You might be looking like this, you'll look more like this. Okay, so that is the epidermis. Now I want to talk about the dermis, which is the connective tissue layer beneath the epidermis. Remember the epidermis is the stratum basal, spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, corneum, okay? That's the epidermis. Those five layers, or four in thin skin. Now we have the, the dermis, which is a connective tissue layer beneath the epidermis, shown here. And the dermis is connected to the epidermis through a basement membrane, as shown here. With, and then you have the various connective tissue components that we're all familiar with in the basement membrane. And we can separate the dermis into two layers, <clears throat> a papillary layer and a reticular layer papillary layer is much smaller than the reticular layer of the dermis. The papillary layer is basically the peg and socket layer that interdigitates into the, into the epidermis. So you can imagine you've got the epidermis layer and you've got a dermis layer, so you've got these two layers, right? And if you apply a shear force just by rubbing, you might split those two layers apart and you get the, ep the, the epidermis coming away from the dermis. 
But if you have this peg and socket arrangement of the papillary layer of the epidermis interdigitating with the dermis, you can apply a shearing force and they're going to hold together. Okay? So that's the whole concept behind these pegs and sockets of the papillary layer that's holding the epidermis connected to the dermis and it's resistant to shear forces that might separate the two. Okay? Now in that in, those, in that papillary layer, we find capillaries, blood vessels, and we find Meissner's corpuscles, which are sensory in nature. Okay, then the second layer of the dermis is the reticular layer. This is mostly connective tissue with blood vessels and some appendages. So, you know, collagen fibers and um, fibroblasts and stuff like that. This is what we recognize as leather. So if you've got leather shoes on, you're wear or a leather belt, you're wearing the reticular layer of probably a cow, okay? It might be a crocodile if you shop at Gucci Gulch. You might have crocodile shoes or something like that, but probably a cow, yeah? So that is what the reticular layer is. That's leather. Of course, the reticular layer is really thick in cows and not in us. So when they tan it, they remove the epidermal layer and then they treat it with chemicals to make it you know, much more resilient and flexible and, and tough. So there you go, reticular layer. So if you look at the um, reticular layer of the dermis, as I mentioned before, we have a bunch of fibroblasts. We have a lot of collagen fibers and elastic fibers in there as well. OK, also we find in the reticular layer, arteriovenous anastomoses. Remember that short circuit where blood could flow directly from an arteriole to a venule and not get through a capillary? So this is going to happen down here. So normally, um, blood is going to flow right up into the papillary layer um, you know, to help in thermoregulation. So if you're really hot for whatever reason, if you've been out in the sun or you've been jogging, the blood vessels will open up and allow blood to flow right up into this capillary, in the papillary layer to facilitate evaporative cooling. Okay, that helps you cool off. Conversely, if it's really cold, the AV shunt will short circuit the circulation of blood away from the papillary layer and keep it down in the, in, um, the, the reticular layer so that then you don't get so much evaporative cooling. So then by regulating the flow of blood between the papillary layer and the reticular layer through the opening or closing of arteriovenous shunts or AV shunts, you can, to some extent, regulate heat loss from the body, i.e. by evaporative cooling or restrictive evaporative cooling. This shows you these AV shunts, right? So you can see if blood flows right up to the surface into the, into the um, papillary layer, that's going to help cool the body. If you close this off and you keep blood down here at the deeper level through an AV shunt, it's going to restrict evaporative cooling. You'll stay a bit warmer. Okay, so there are different um, sensory structures in the dermis. Um, there's the Meissner's corpuscles that occur, occur in the um, papillary layer. There are also, and these are associated with light touch, very light sensation, okay? Then there's Pacinian corpuscles that look in cross-section like a sliced onion. These are deeper down in the dermis, and these are associated with more pressure-associated sensation. You know, when I press, I'm feeling the pressure. I'm, I'm probably, act, you know, activating some of the Pacinian corpuscles. Of course, we talked about Merkel cells, and sometimes we have free nerve fibers as well. And this is just some diagrams of them. Okay, so that's the epidermis and the dermis. Remember, the hypodermis is um, not part of the integument. That's the adipose tissue, sometimes called superficial fascia in gross anatomy. Okay, so we looked at how sunlight can damage the skin. Here's two identical twins. One was a smoker and one was a non-smoker. Okay, the smoker doesn't look so good skin-wise. You can see his skin is more crinkled, whereas the non-smoker, his skin is a little smoother. Okay. And again, smoking, all of those compounds that are ingested with, um, in the smoke gets into the blood, um, it affects the way also that the, um, the, 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 the extracellular matrix components of the 
dermis are deposited. It's more irregular deposition. So, you know, there's a reason not to smoke, just for vanity's reason. You're going to look. I can tell. I can see. I, I can tell if per a person's smoker or not sometimes. Like, you know, have you ever played this game where you're sitting around waiting for somebody and, you, and you're doing um, uh, uh, kind of like just looking at people and, and trying to figure out what do you think that, what does that person do? What is their profession? You know, well, what, you know, where, where, where are they going? Who are they meeting? You kind of sit in there. And sometimes you'll, I've, I've looked at people and I thought, you know, like that person is very trim. They're, they're, they're slender. They're very taut. You know, they've got a pretty good physique. You can there at a distance. And, and, and you're thinking, eh, it's probably about a 25-year-old. They come up and their face is wrinkled to all hell. And I think, that's a smoker. You can tell. <laughs> you can tell sometimes a person where they call smoker's face, right? Smoker's face. You can tell a person that's a heavy smoker because their face is really wrinkled, prematurely wrinkled compared to what the rest of them looks like, you know? So if you ever do, if you ever play that game of just, you know, waiting, um, you, sometimes you can pick the smoker's face as opposed to the non-smoker's face. And here's a classical example, identical twins, same genetic background, right? One's a smoker, one's not a smoker. Okay, so let's look at appendages of the skin. So hair, hair and nails. Let's do fingernails and toenails first. So I'm not going to belabor the point on this. Basically, I just have to mention it. We've got the nail plate, the eponychium, which is where um, the matrix resides that gives rise to the nail plate, and that that resides on a nail bed shown here. And just underneath the nail plate at the tip, we call that the hypernechum. Okay, that's just the names of fingernails. I'm not going to belabor that. I don't think it's that interesting to be quite tr truthful. But anyway, hair, hair, hair follicle and bulb. So a hair consists of the shaft, and the follicle is that part beneath the surface of the skin. And the follicle, or the root, I should say, is that part beneath the skin. Can, the, the root consists mostly of the follicle, and then there's a bulb at the bottom from which the hair grows itself. Okay, so uh, and this bulb at the bottom from which the hair grows consists of a dermal papilla. So this part in here is the dermis and this, the, this other, the growing hair is epidermal in origin. And this dermal papilla has blood vessels in it that gives nutrients um, to the keratinocytes of the growing hair of the bulb to provide nutrients to let it grow. Right, so that's the dermal papilla. Turns out that you know these cells are proliferating of the, the, the growing hair, the germinal matrix cells of the, the bulb. These proliferate quite rapidly because obviously your hair grows all the time and you're always getting the thing cut. Um, and these cells, because they're rapidly proliferating, they're sensitive to chemotherapy. So are more sensitive than the rest of the body. So that's, that's why sometimes you see people that are having chemo for cancer, you know, they're bald, right? They've lost all their hair. And the reason for that is that these particular cells right here, okay, of the germinal matrix, which are rapidly proliferating, are very sensitive to these chemo drugs. And so these cells get killed by chemo drugs. Not all, but some, depends upon the therapy. And the hair falls out. Okay, if we look at a schematic of a cross-section through the hair, here's our papilla. Okay, here's the bulb giving rise to the hair shaft itself. In the hair, we'll have a central medulla and a cortex on the outside. That's the hair itself. Then outside, we have a couple of layers, the internal root sheath and the external root sheath. The internal root sheath here only extends as far as the opening of sebaceous glands onto the hair shaft, whereas the external, sheet, ex external root sheath in yellow extends all the way onto the surface of the integument and crosses over and becomes the epidermis. Okay? That's, so that's the internal root sheath and external root sheath. So here's a cross section through a hair shaft. We have the central medulla, we have the cortex, and then we have these little cuticles or the kind of small barbs on the outside of the of the hair is shown here. So these small barbs then help to, to anchor and lock the hair into the integument so it just doesn't fall out. If we look at a cross-section through hair, 
Again, here's our um, hair, um, most of which is the um, cortex, the medulla in the center. And then we have a couple of different layers that I mentioned, the internal root sheath and the external root sheath. Okay? They're the ones that you need to be familiar with, internal and external. Don't worry about these glassy membranes that separate out the internal, external, and um, internal to the hair shaft itself. The next thing I want to talk about is the erector pili muscle. So this is a smooth muscle that's connected to the growing hair and it can contract or relax and control the hair moving up or down. So this occurs in two instances that I can think of. Fear, fight, fear, flight, fight reaction. So like a cat, you know, when a cat comes in contact with a dog or gets a scare, sometimes you see the hair stand up on the cat's body, right? So what's happened there is that this erector pili muscle here has pulled on this part of the hair shaft and it was like this and it gets pulled up straight. So that makes the hair stand up. So now the cat looks twice the size as it did before. So the dog might think twice before it gets into a fight with the cat because the hair's made the animal look bigger. The other um, instance is um, when a person is cold, the hair will stand up on your arms and legs, right? So what that does is when the hair stands up, it increases the, the boundary layer. In other words, if there's wind or whatever, by increasing the boundary layer, that essentially increases the layer of insulation over your epidermis, and so you're not going to have as great an evaporative cooling from the skin. And again, the reason that hair is standing up is because of the erector pili muscle. And you get those little bumps. Those little bumps is where the, down here, where the erector pili muscle is actually pulling on the hair shaft. So underneath, you get the little bump, and then the hair is standing straight up. Okay, so there's different phases of hair growth. They talk about antigen, catagen, telogen. I just mentioned them here. Um, miscellaneous characteristics. Hair can grow either cyclical or asynchronous. There's variations in the number of follicle, follicles between people. People become partially or completely bald. This can be genetic and hormonal. Hormonal because men tend to um, get bald more so than women, but women can also have thinning of hair. And then, of course, hair gets gray as you get older, and that's because there's a loss of melanin um, from the melanocytes as people get older, and so you don't get as much pigmentation in the hair. Then I want to talk about glands of the integument. We see sweat glands, sebaceous glands in the integument. So here's the first I want to talk about are sebaceous glands. These secrete onto the hair shaft, okay, as shown here in red. Sebaceous glands occur at the level above the internal root sheath. The internal root sheath peters out at the level of the sebaceous gland. It doesn't extend beyond where the sebaceous gland opens onto the hair shaft. And the sebaceous glands are a simple branched asinine gland. Remember classification of glands. So it's simple branched asinine, as shown here. And it contains a large number of lipid droplets, and it secretes by a holocrine mode of secretion. So what does that mean? Holocrine means the entire cell ruptures in the nucleus as well as all the contents are discharged. So it's like suicide, right? Holocrine, whole cell ruptures and releases the um, sebum, which contains a lot of lipids. And this is thought to um, have um, an antibacterial and fungal anti-activity and also um, acts as um, kind of giving a, a, another layer under the surface of the skin. Okay, so that was sebaceous glands. And then I want to talk about ecrine sweat glands. Okay, let me, let me just clarify one thing right up front. So we have ecrine sweat glands, and we also have apocrine sweat glands that I'll talk about next. Both ecrine and apocrine sweat glands secrete both by a merocrine mode of secretion. Okay? So this is an old terminology. They used to think apocrine sweat glands secreted by an apocrine mechanism, but in fact it's a merocrine mechanism. So we have the two sweat glands called ecrine and apocrine. Both of them secrete by a merocrine mode. So going back to the ecrine sweat gland, these are the ones that open onto all surfaces of the body. And they contain a secretory portion and an excretory duct portion. It's just a long, single, coiled duct. 
The secretory portion contains two cell types, dark cells and clear cells. The clear cells <coughs> produce sweat, and the dark cells produce a, a mus, mus, mucus type material, uh, maybe like pheromonal in function. Here are the cell types again, the dark cell, which may have a um, pheromonal type function, and the, the um, clear cells, which are responsible for um, producing the fluid that um, creates the sweat when you sweat fluid onto the surface of the skin. Now, so remember there's the secretory portion and then there's the, the duct portion that transports the fluid. The duct portion is classified as stratified cuboidal epithelium, okay? This is pretty much it for stratified cuboidal classification. It's the duct portion of the ecrine sweat gland. Okay, and if we look at the function of these ecrine sweat glands, as, as I mentioned, there's a secretory duct, highly coiled, which is creating the fluid of sweat. And then as that f protein free filtrate of fluid passes into the excretory duct, it's not completely, uh, it's protein free most for the most part, but it may contain ions, and so sometimes well, it does, in fact, have some of these um, ions removed from the fluid also during transit onto the surface of the skin. But even so, not all of these um, ions are removed because if you taste sweat, taste your own sweat, sometimes it tastes a little bit salty, so it didn't get all of the sodium and chloride ions out, but a lot of it is. Okay, and then the second of the sweat glands is the apocrine sweat gland, which also secretes by merocrine mode of secretion, and these are restricted to the axillary regions of the body, so the armpits, uh, groin area, places like that. And they secrete onto the hair shaft, and of course the armpits and the groin area contain a lot of hair, so it kind of makes sense. And these consist of just one cell type, a dark cell, which is thought perhaps to have a residual pheromonal function, probably that has no real significant function in humans, but maybe in other animals that secrete pheromones um, for marking of territory, things like that, these cells could be more active. And they open onto, um, I said, the, uh, the hair shafts in the axillary regions. These also have a much larger luminal diameter. So the, in comparison to an adjacent um, uh, merocrine sweat gland, you can identify the different types of glands. OK, question. Langerhans cells are, see, terrific, OK. So we've got a lab. Do you want me to just keep going with the lab? Yeah. Okay. We shouldn't be too long with this. And here we go. Okay. So the lab. Okay. So if we look at, um, let me see, display setting, swap. Yeah. Um, if we look at a section through skin, this is thick skin. You can see, well, here's the epidermis, is these layers here, right? The darker purple is the living cell layers. And then we have the corneum and the lucidum. This is the lucidum and the corneum of this thick skin. And then down here, this kind of more broken up is the, the, um, the reticular layers of the, um, the dermis. And of course, the papillary layer would be interdigitated with the epidermis. And then down here, this adipose tissue is the hypodermis. Okay? So hopefully we can recognize those different layers of skin. And this is muscle down here. Okay, and then a higher power view. So this is thick skin again. So labeled. So this is dermis down here. So and then from, from B to the very top is epidermis. B is the stratum basal. S is stratum spinosum. G is stratum granulosum. L is stratum lucidum. So it has to be thick skin. And C is stratum corneum of thick skin. OK? Questions? OK, um, stratum basal is the deepest layer of the epidermis. So that would be this layer here, basal cell layer. And above the stratum basal then is the stratum spinosum, the spiny cell layer. That's usually the thickest layer of the living cells of the epidermis, shown here. 
Yes. Down here? Yeah, this is the basal going here. It's, the stratum basal is going up and down on the, on, the, on the epidermal side of the papillary layer of the dermis. So these are the, this is the papillary layer, the finger-like interdigitations of the dermis, right? So on top of the papillary layer in the epidermis is the stratum basal, like here. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, so here's the stratum spinosum again. You can see now that it's at high power when the tissue shrank the, where the desmosomes are attached, you can see this um, appearance of spiny type cytoplasm. And that's because these desmosomes here are holding cells together via keratin filaments. Okay, then the third layer, the living cell layer, is the granulosum. You can see kind of it's granular. These, and it's also the granules give rise to this darker color as well. So that's the last layer of the living cell layer. Then in thick skin, we have a stratum lucidum. doesn't really show up here. And of course, the stratum corneum. These are all dead cells. Um, thin skin, okay, you can see the... the um, the corneum is, is not so well developed now. And this, so this darker purple layer here would be the living cells of the epidermis, and then beneath that would be the dermis. And then these, some of these rounded structures are oblique sections through some hair follicles, and here's some sweat glands down here. Okay, so now here's thin skin again. So epidermis is this layer here. Dermis is down here. This is stratum basal, which will contain melanocytes in it, stratum basal, stratum, granulo, uh, stratum um, spinosum, stratum granulosum, so you can see the granules, and stratum corneum. Any questions? Okay, low power view of the dermis now. So the epidermis is this darker stained area here. Papillary layer, the peg and socket interdigitations into the epidermis, and the more uh, reticular layer is shown here with all of the connective tissue um, in the reticular layer. Okay? Okay, so here is, um, this is thick skin, epidermis, you can see the very thick layer of the stratum corneum. And down here, we can see some glands. So in here, we would have the Meissner's corpuscles in the peg and socket um, component of the, the um, papillary layer of the dermis. The rest of the dermis would be the reticular layer. And down here, we can see the uh, Pacinian corpuscles. They look like onions in slice. So here's a Meissner's corpuscle in that papillary layer. Kind of looks like it's something wrapped around. So this is sensory for light touch. And adjacent in this other component of the papillary layer, we can see a blood vessel in cross-section, okay? Here's a Pacinian corpuscle deeper down. Again, it looks like this onion cut in cross-section. Any questions? <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, hypodermis, okay, I think I've convinced you hypodermis is not part of the integument. It is adipose tissue. Okay, if we look now at hair follicles, um, you can see, you know, there's a bulb at the bottom, there's the shaft, and there's the internal and external root sheath associated with the hair follicle. In cross section, you can see these, the hair shaft and the follicle um, embedded in the integument. And at high power view, we can see the dermal papilla in here. And then the bulb here, giving rise to the internal root sheath and the external root sheath. And here's the hair shaft itself. High power view, we can see the dermal papilla, okay, the shaft, the internal root sheath, the external root sheath. In cross section, here's the shaft. So it looks like it's all cortex. Can't see a medulla here the internal root sheath, the external root sheath. Any questions? 
fingernails, okay? Cuticle, I guess if you have your fingernails done at the, um, what do you call those places where you get them done? Cosmetologist or something or other? Is that what it is? Nail salon. Nail salon, yeah, that's it. That's it. I've never been. My wife and daughter go all the time. So we're always trying to find the cheapest place that does a good job. Anyway, you go to the nail salon. I guess what do they do? They get Do they scrape away this cuticle part? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So there's the cuticle. There's the fingernail. So that's the, um, the eponychium, which is that cuticle part. Hyponychium is the bit underneath there. Okay. There it is there. Eponychium is that cuticle. Hyponychium is down here. Here's the nail plate and the bed underneath, which gives rise to the plate. Okay, sebaceous glands, shown here, secrete sebum, onto the hair shaft, okay? So, and remember the sebaceous gland is that point at which the internal root sheath peters out. It won't extend beyond the sebaceous gland. And then I want to talk about briefly the um, ecrine sweat gland, which is all over the body. It consists of, and it's a single long coiled duct for the most part. The secretory portion is down here. It's getting making that protein-free filtrate, I guess getting fluid from adjacent capillaries. And uh, most of the protein is reabsorbed. And then the fluid that passes through the duct part has its some ions removed before the sweat exits onto the surface of the skin. Okay, um, so that's eucrine sweat glands at low power. So like here, Here's one, here's another, here's the glandular por here's the secretory portion here. These are all ecrine sweat glands, the coiled portion down here. Okay, here again is this the um, secretory portion, and here's the duct portion, which again is we can always identify the duct portion of the ecrine sweat gland because it is stratified cuboidal epithelium. Okay. Okay, and here's, here's the duct portion of an eucrine sweat gland making its way to the surface of the skin. And then we also have the other type of sweat gland, which is the apocrine sweat gland, which is associated with the axillary regions of the body. They always secrete onto a hair shaft, and they have a much wider lumen. Okay, so here you can see how big the lumen is of this apocrine sweat gland. Okay, so here you can see next to each other, apocrine sweat glands and ecrine sweat glands. Note the apocrine sweat glands have a much larger lumen relative to these ecrine sweat glands. And these ecrine sweat glands consist of the secretory portion and the duct portion. This is the stratified cuboidal, one, two, three. Stratified cuboidal staining darker. So this would be the ecrine sweat gland. This is the apocrine sweat gland, right? Yeah. Um, this is just showing desmosomes holding keratin filaments together, cross-section of a hair. So in the middle we have the, the uh, medulla, around it we have the cortex, then we have the internal root sheath, and then we have the external root sheath in a cross-section of the hair. Don't worry about Huxley, Huxley's layers and Henley's layers, the glassy membranes, that's getting too complicated. Okay, skin. Uh, fibro uh, keratinocytes, you can see um, in this particular layer, this particular cell, we have some melanin granules that are starting to accumulate. Okay, More melanin granules in these keratinocytes of the spinosum. This is the, you know, you can see how spiny this is. So this would be the stratum spinosum. This would be a keratinocyte that's got some melanin granules in it. Okay, comparison of thick skin and thin skin. Have a look at these two slides, side by side. One of them is thick skin, one of them is thin skin. Correct. Okay, any questions as to why that is? Okay, and here's a direct comparison of ecrine and apocrine sweat glands. Remember, the apocrine, which opens into axillary regions, has a very wide lumen. The, the ecrine, which is all over the body, has a much narrower lumen 
of the secretory portion. So there's a direct comparison side by side of ecrine and apocrine. Okay? Okay, the question. The asterisk shows which of these structures? What, do you, what was it again? E, oh, okay. I thought you said B. Yeah, no, E is correct. Okay, so that is it for my lectures for the first half of the course. Dr. Andrews will pick up next week. Okay, good luck on the exam. Study the PowerPoints as your primary source. Harass the TAs as your next primary source. They are know all and they will be able to answer all questions. I'm sure of it. See you in a month or more. <laughs>